so thank you very much for, for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts on uh, geostructures. And um, uh, what I would like to go over is some um, um, what we are concerned about um, from a practitioner, but also I think all of us, is that um, we have even in, we are doing, I think, a, a relatively good job with new structures for earthquakes and um, uh, using technologies, but we are have to shift our thinking to what happens with um, the new norm of having um, a higher frequency, less intense uh, extreme events. And we cannot ignore climate change, although we're talking about uh, earthquakes. So uh, just because um, one of the parts that are affected is highly populated areas uh, that we uh, may not be in the best um, uh, selected locations. And what could happen is with smaller hazard exposure, we can have a much uh, bigger um, catastrophe. An example is the 2018 um, year, which was, in terms of earthquakes, uh, unremarkable. Um, but the overall, in terms of hazard and lives lost, we had uh, tremendous losses because we are dealing with a new norm, particularly with a dense urbanization. So, um, you know, I, you know, the word of resilience. I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but. Um, uh, some of the pioneers um, of introducing these words to uh, earthquake engineering, uh, professors Bruno and Reinhold from the University of Buffalo, uh, they're themselves concerned that we are dealing with a new bubble tower uh, where um, this was a search they did on in 2019 about the word. And um, uh, what, uh, what they found found is that quantifying earthquake uh, engineering resilience had only um, increased by a factor of three from one search to three uh, because nobody was searching for that. So um, what do I think? I think that we have to move from when and how to um, if and from if to, to um, you know, that is definitely we are dealing with extreme events that is not just earthquakes and we need to have them. Um, um, a, a global holistic view on, on this issue. So um, I, I think that resilience is a choice for geotechnical engineers as well as structural. Um, it's simple, it works. Um, the alternative is no longer enough. And um, uh, it, it, is, it is a means that we can use to build trust in investments in engineering, but also build trust with the public that supports decisions like that. So for me, a very nice definition other than the conventional that we use in engineering is that it's, it's a property of what an engineering system does. And this is what the example I'm going to share with you um, demonstrates versus what, what it has. So um, I'll share a story with you. Um, uh, one of my first projects, um, were actually uh, serving as um, with a, a fast consulting firm to WSP uh, in this magnificent building that is the Torre Mayor building in Mexico City. It's in the heart of the Threaded Lake. And um, uh, there was a collaboration between industry and practice led by Dr. Ahmed Rahimian, uh, still the director of buildings in WSP and the University of Buffalo uh, for innovative um, diamond-shaped dampers uh, that worked uh, both for wind and earthquake. Uh, so uh, the building went into operations uh, around 1999, and since then it has experienced several earthquakes, several winds. So uh, it so happens the developer resides in the building. They have their offices there. So every time there is an earthquake, the most recent one, the 2017 Pueblo Morelos, um, Ahmad called and uh, to see if the building is okay. And uh, they're like, yeah, the building is okay. It's as it always, you know, behaved very well. We, and people inside the building, they could see there was an earthquake from the outside because things were shaking, there was dust. Uh, but they said we had a different problem. And we said, what, what is it? And they said, well, people started running into the building when the earthquake happened. 
And to me, that is the best definition of resilience and the best advertising for protective systems, because I have experienced it in Mexico, where people say, does my building have these crisscross things in new developments? Um, it is the first application of performance-based design in Mexico City, and I just think we don't do a good enough job to, to convey the message of the value of innovation. So um, connecting to John's uh, presentation, I, I, I agree life safety is not enough. The uh, NIST FEMA efforts for functional recovery is something that, that, that not only brings, uh, pushes engineering forward, but also um, reflects life uh, quality goals in addition to life safety, which I think it's a demand from the society as well. So uh, in the terms of geotechnical foundation design, um, we, I think we have been, uh, uh, losing something in translation where um, we think that, you know, factor of safety is the only way to go. I'm sure a lot of the structural engineers are getting this, they would be at, uh, agreeing with me. Um, because we, we feel that that's what we have to do. But uh, the, the code is just basics. And we, we should and we can do better than that. So a long time ago, another story very short, um, Joel and um, uh, Professor Conde, Professor Espero, we worked on a very unusual project and we have many, many years ago to define a performance-based design for geotech geostructures. So an equivalent of the state of the damage, this is an example for a dam or an embankment uh, where you look at a frequent event where you need to have a healthy factor of safety, I'm going to use that word, uh, but when you're looking at the rare event on close to design levels, uh, you want to look at the formations more than anything. And in the very rare event, you can even maybe accept uh, large deformations or even collapse if that satisfies the overall performance of the system. So I wanted to bring one example of retaining walls uh, where we tested the concepts of functional recovery or resilience-based design um, with some factors. Um, the operation or functionality after design level and large earthquakes, uh, preserving structural integrity after extreme earthquakes, and demonstrate resiliency through redundancy, one of the core values of um, that concept. So let's look at two um, uh, apparently similar um, uh, walls that can be used um, uh, for, um, uh, for uh, comparison. So um, if we look at them from a factor of safety perspective, they apparently look the same, um, and, uh, but we want to test them. So here are the two walls, the soil uh, and everything in terms of the demands on the system are identical. On the left, you see a pile supported wall or a tangent concrete pile wall, which is a conventional design versus a mechanically stabilized uh, wall system that relies on pull forces uh, to provide stability. Uh, the, um, the soil is a sandy soil. We have um, an equivalent factor of safety for static conditions of 1.8, which is something you would, you, within what you would use as a designer, and a very healthy factor of safety of 1.2 for a PGA of um, about 0.16 G of, um, for these two walls. So apparently this, these two systems are the same from a factor of safety. Uh, this is in plan. The, the steel grid that is spaced in height every 60 centimeters. So, um, and the, in plan, there is a 20 by 20 centimeter grid. Uh, this was a collaboration between industry partners and European universities, uh, the National Technical University of Athens, my alma mater, and um, University of Dundee, um, and has continued uh, since a lot. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details. A lot of the details I, I, I have to admit I don't know. Uh, uh, but a lot of um, experimental work has been done similar to what US, UCSD had. Uh, so the pullout forces were simulated 
um, in a shaking table, there was laminar boxes that were used, um, but there is still uh, work that could be done on this. Uh, so uh, we, we used numerical simulations with uh, the two parameters, the static load and the dynamic load to confirm that we are on, for both walls, we have this factor for safety. And then uh, we decided to um, subject those to uh, a design level earthquake and um, a, a extreme earthquakes. So, um, uh, one of the events that is the extreme is the Rinaldi earthquake and the Gilroy is what you see as the purple line, uh, which um, is a design level earthquake. So um, uh, mind you that the MSC wall is going to be shown on a green color, the red color is the pile wall. So in the design level earthquake, the, the Gilroy motion from the Loma Prieta, um, we are looking at the top of the wall displacement. Uh, and you see that both of them are within design performance objectives. The PGA here is ab above the pseudostatic PGA 0.4G and the um, MSC walls behaves very well. Uh, the uh, pile wall is reaching probably the limits and you will see how we look at this. Um, definitely when you Im impose the Rinaldi 94 Northridge earthquake, you can see that with a double the PGA, the uh, conventional wall has reached half a meter of displacement. And the, the, um, the um, MSC wall uh, only a one third of a meter. So what are the proper quantifiers? Because this is not apple to apple in terms of performance uh, observations. So for the conventional wall, the most important parameter would be the, um, the moment curvature at the fixity of the wall. And um, when you look at uh, this curve at the end of the shaking in the extreme event, uh, you have already reached uh, practically the capacity. So most likely this wall will not be able to be used again. Now, um, if you look at the MSC wall, the most important parameter, uh, it would be the axial stresses on the, um, uh, on the um, reinforcement. And uh, what we see is that the largest um, axial force happens on um, row 17, I'm sorry, which is down here, which, which is to be expected that the bottom would be uh, more loaded. Uh, your yielding is at around uh, 500 megapascals. So um, definitely the wall is able to take that without going into yielding. So this is the, the uh, comparison um, between the two performances. And uh, definitely the, the differences that uh, I, can, I can see is that um, the one has already reached its, its capacity and it would need serious retrofit. So uh, moving it further, looking into redundancy, we proved that the MSC wall uh, behaves better under extreme events beyond design. So we said, okay, let's see what happens if we um, could remove some of this reinforcement. And we came up with something very surprising, which was it didn't make a difference in terms of displacement at the top of the wall, whether or not we had half of the reinforcement or if we had the full. So of course, uh, we would like to, um, and to uh, reduce that. So if you're like more like my side of things, uh, then uh, money will start thinking it's like, okay, I can save the client a lot of money, right? Just give me the proof and I'll do it. And many of you on the other side of the fence is that this is an interesting problem. Either they have made a mistake or there's something we don't get. So it's a great uh, research project. And Lilia, I think we should think that uh, this is a great collaborative project. So that's what we did. And uh, we started looking at the x-ray of this wall. So on the left, you see again, the behavior of the, the design uh, under extreme events. So what we realized is that when you start x-raying with, um, uh, with numerical analysis, you can see that the, um, 
the less expensive uh, wall has been overstressing a lot of the reinforcement and has started overstressing also the base of it, but also the pullout forces are significant. So um, yes, it would save money, but I don't think it would do very well, or at least definitely it would not do as well in the smaller repetitive events and definitely not as well in another big one. So um, uh, what, what you see is um, the plastic strings uh, uh, contours that uh, were developed, um, I believe this was done in Abacus. So, um, and the proof to that is that uh, earth retaining systems as MSC walls have traditionally been behaving very well, uh, which is something very important that we have recently started doing. And I must say that gear has been, um, uh, has been a driver on this in the geotechnical field, is to learn not only from disasters, but also from uh, geostructures that have behaved well when they probably um, uh, would not be apparent to all of us. So um, uh, we have in Japan 98% um, of uh, 1,400 reinforced soil walls had very little damage in the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. But also we see that very often because of redundancy. Um, so this is how we try to simulate the concepts of resilience in geotechnical engineering so, um, but we did not have full, full scale testing. We did not have shaking, full shaking table tests. So something like that would be fantastic to be worked on at the new experimental facilities combined with laminar boxes and with uh, soil testing. So something that I have learned from um, uh, my professor, Professor Gazeras, but also from um, a UCSD work, from Professor Cutter is that, um, you know, stronger is not always better in earthquakes. Uh, Kobe, the Hanshin Expressway reminded us very vividly. Uh, so at some point, and um, uh, Dr. Panayotu also, um, also showed earlier, work that is fundamental in the shift that is needed to this factor of safety concept for extreme events. So, um, uh, this concept of R equal one, of having the foundation remain elastic uh, at all costs, uh, you know, it's something that penalizes tremendously the superstructure and creates failures like the ones you see on the left. This is from a building after the 1999 Athens earthquake in Greece. And um, allowing some yielding uh, could um, relieve the superstructure could create better performance. Of course, it has to be controlled. Of course, safety has to be satisfied. But at some point, we have to move things forward. And only if we can validate them, these concepts could go from uh, academia to um, guidelines and eventually to practice safely. And going back to the value, for me, I ha it has been um, fundamental and um, so important. Any work that I have done through NSF funded year missions and the work that we did after that, uh, this is the earthquake in, um, in Greece, in Cephalonia in 2014. Uh, this is primarily gear work, but it was also supported by EERI and ATC and of course our local uh, partners. And um, I will show you a tremendous record that is uh, very well known now, they have that uh, record. Um, and we looked at this building, which is the typical confined masonry type of uh, structure in the Balkans. And everything else around this building was like the bottom picture. Uh, but this building had, it's a new building, it's a 95 building built to code, but it had everything going wrong for it because it's at the corner, it is, has a soft story, it's a cafe on the bottom, and um, it has a confined masonry, and we have this tremendous record. This building, I, I, I was there, had nothing, only a couple of bricks, 
fell from it and you might say, okay, that is a good design, but um, wait until you see the record. Um, we did some work to not to cheat because our records had some um, soil effects. So we did some deconvolution to get them on the rock level. And I will show you how big these records are if you compare them to um, any, any uh, record, it's up there and it, it has been verified. So here is what this two, three story building um, would, should, should have felt in the range of, uh, you know, 0.2 to 0.3 seconds. It should have felt uh, 3Gs, put the R factor, still, still the design is down there. So we could not understand when we modeled it, we had the records, uh, we had the, all the drawings, we were able to get them from the owners of the buildings because that's typical in Greece and they, they were willing to share. So um, when we modeled it, uh, we, we could not get there. We would, see, we would agree that this should have collapsed. So um, when my structural colleague Ramon Gilsons uh, put the infills in the model and the special tie beams that these types of structures have, the period of this building shifted to um, a very, very short period. So it, it, it behaved as a rigid block and it explained the observation. So this is an amazing example of something that went well, despite being multiple of times loaded to more than its capacity. Um, so what we have learned from that, that it's great to go after earthquakes and try to create um, these histories, as we did recently in Mexico, where the 80, uh, an 80 team, dedicated team um, uh, got data from a number of buildings for different soil conditions in, um, in Mexico City to, to study non-ductile um, concrete behavior uh, and validate um, uh, different um, um, uh, different um, uh, FEMA and NIST funded uh, standards for these buildings. So uh, another point that I think is, is very, very important is how we communicate not only uh, with the public and how we can explain uh, these concepts that, that usually are highly technical, but they can be explained very well, but also with each other. So this is my colleague who modeled uh, the structural colleague who modeled the building, Ramon, and that is me. And, and he had no interest in the liquefaction. That's the same earthquake uh, that I was fascinated by. And uh, he, was looking, he, he, he was looking at the structural collapse and, and something on, on his side. So I have, he was looking at stuff, but he immediately got bored from what I was looking at. So we need to communicate well with each other. And one way is to communicate, I have found to be, uh, very important is the visual that we are able to reproduce at WSP. So for, for you structural people, uh, you might think that this is a building, uh, but it's not a building. It is a soil column simulating what happens in the, in the big um, 100 meter depth of the Mexico City profile uh, with actual records from the 2017 earthquake. And uh, what you see in the two X and Y directions is displacements from wave propagation studies we have done using known shear wave velocity data. And what you see on the pink, on the right you see we are already almost at a minute of this earthquake. And what you see on the pink is the jello of uh, the Mexico City clay in this section, it is a good 10, 15, 20 meters uh, of uh, jello moving. And as you can see, the bottom is not moving that much. It, we have found means like that to be extremely useful and also help us visualize and focus more on what is important. Um, so um, where, where I see um, this important work that Neri is doing, uh, particularly as it relates to the facilities at UCSD, is that uh, definitely there are needs to understand fundamental behaviors. For example, in the wall that I showed, why they are different. But uh, these to be validated and calibrated, they need experiments in different scales, micro scales, full scales. And um, uh, I think that innovation through materials, through analysis and concepts 
um, should focus on other aspects of other beyond life safety, such as um, uh, redundancy, um, and incorporate any lessons we have learned from rapid, from uh, um, ear work uh, in reconnaissance, and to uh, prove concepts, because proving concepts um, uh, does so many things, including the, the trust factor, but also offering optimization of the risk and the cost, which is very important for funding and proof of funding if an earthquake happens. Um, so all of this, I think, um, create a fantastic environment to grow ideas on both directions. And um, with that, I, I hope I did not go over, uh, Joel, and I want to thank all of you for your attention in my stories, and also to uh, the NERI program at TCSD for inviting me, my mentors, George Gazeta, Sahmar Rahimian, and my collaborators from NTUA and WSP that contributed to this. And uh, please don't be afraid to, um, to think outside of the box, as Tara said earlier. Thank you very much.